you have your Bible, turn with me to Luke chapter 20. Luke chapter 20, this morning we're going to be in verses 1 through 26. If you're new with us, uh, we generally preach through books of the Bible here at First Baptist Olo. We've been in Luke for quite some time now. And as I mentioned, uh, finding ourselves this morning in Luke chapter 20. Who do you think you are? Have you ever heard these words? Generally, when, when we hear those words or when we utter those words, they come from a place of questioning authority. Who do you think you are? Maybe you've heard these words and that brings a little PTSD based upon whatever situation it may, you may have been in. A young employee made a decision that upset his senior manager who stormed into the office demanding to know who had given the employee the authority to make such a call. The tension was evident. The young worker stammered, trying to explain their reasoning, but the manager wasn't interested in explanations. Who do you think you are? He asked the employee. This was about authority. This was about, about who had the right to make decisions. Now, it's interesting how quickly we bristle when someone questions our authority or when we perceive someone stepping beyond their proper role. Whether it's in the workplace, whether it's in our homes, whether it's in the government or even in the church, authority is something we all wrestle with daily. Who has the right to make decisions? How far can those decisions extend? Who has the final say? Whose authority overrides whose? Well, 2,000 years ago, in the bustling courts of the Jerusalem temple, Jesus faced a similar confrontation. The religious leaders of his day, the ones who had spent generations controlling the spiritual narrative of Israel, approached him with that same challenging question, who do you think you are? Well, they phrased it more formally, tell us by what authority do you do these things, or who is it that gave you this authority? Now, this wasn't meant to be just a casual inquiry. This was a direct challenge to Jesus' ministry, to his teaching, and to his very identity. The religious leaders had watched as Jesus cleared the temple. They taught that as he taught the people with authority and had people hanging on his, to his very words, and they felt threatened, and they wanted to put him in his place. And so what unfolds in this passage is really a fascinating series of encounters that all center around this core issue of authority, God's authority, human authority, and the proper response to both. You see, through a clever counter-question, a pointed parable, and a brilliant response about taxes, Jesus not only silences his critics, but also teaches us truth about how we should relate to authority in our own lives. And let me say this, and I mentioned it this past Wednesday, we plan our, our, our preaching schedule months in advance, year even, in advance. It's no coincidence that this passage comes two days before a major election in our country. I think that it gives us insight, and we'll talk about some of that momentarily as we get how, in how we can respond this week. And I hope and pray that we're attentive to the Spirit this morning as He guides us through His Word. These aren't just ancient debates, church. These are truths that will shape how we live, how we lead in our homes, our workplaces, our communities, and our churches today. And I pray that as we approach this text that the Lord would bless the preaching of His Word. If you are able, would you stand in honor of the reading of God's Word. I'm going to read Luke chapter 20, verses 1 through 26. The Word of God reads, I'm reading from the English Standard Version. 
One day, as Jesus was teaching the people in the temple and preaching the gospel, the chief priest and the scribes with the elders came up and said to him, Tell us by what authority you do these things, or who it is that gave you this authority. He answered them, I will also ask you a question. Now tell me, was the baptism of John from heaven or from man? And they discussed it with one another, saying, If we say from heaven, he will say, Why did you not believe him? But if we say from man, all the people will stone us to death, for they are convinced that John was a prophet. So they answered that they did not know where it came from. And Jesus said to them, Neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. And he began to tell the people this parable. A man planted a vineyard and let it out to tenants and went into another country for a long while. When the time came, he sent a servant to the tenants so that they would give him some of the fruit of the vineyard. But the tenants beat him and sent him away empty-handed. And he sent another servant, but they also beat and treated him shamefully and sent him away empty-handed. And he sent a third. This one also they wounded and cast out. Then the owner of the vineyard said, What shall I do? I will send my beloved son. Perhaps they will respect him. But when the tenants saw him, they said to themselves, This is the heir. Let us kill him so that the inheritance may be ours. And they threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. What then will the owner of the vineyard do to them? He will come and destroy those tenants and give the vineyard to others. When they heard this, they said, surely not. But he looked directly at them and said, what then is this that is written, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. Everyone who falls on that stone will be broken to pieces, and when it falls on anyone, it will crush him. The scribes and the chief priests sought to lay hands on him at that very hour, for they perceived that he had told this parable against them, but they feared the people. So they watched him and sent spies who pretended to be sincere, that they might catch him in something he said, so as to deliver him up to the authority and jurisdiction of the governor. So they asked him, Teacher, we know that you speak and teach rightly and show no partiality, but truly teach the way of God. Is it lawful for us to give tribute to Caesar or not? But he perceived their craftiness and said to them, Show me a denarius, whose likeness and inscription does it have? They said, Caesar's. And he said, Then render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. And they were not able in the presence of the people to catch him in what he said. But marveling at his answer, they became silent. Pray with me. Father, your word is holy, your word is inspired, your word is pure. May your Holy Spirit use it in our hearts, in our lives, to sanctify us, to edify us, to teach us, to guide us, to direct us, to change us, to transform us, to draw us to repentance where needed. God, your word is powerful. We trust it. May we proclaim it boldly. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. So as we know, Jesus has made it to Jerusalem during the Passover season and entered the temple to find all sorts of unrighteous things taking place. He has entered Jerusalem as the Messiah, and his actions in teaching in the temple have thrown down the gauntlet to religious authorities of Jerusalem. We see that we saw this last week in 1945 through 48. Now they take up the challenge and the rest of chapter 20 as they have taken up this challenge to push back on Jesus will continue these public confrontations. And while the authorities remain hostile, the larger crowd in the court of Gentiles remains at this point at least potentially open to Jesus's appeal or so it seems to us. It is only when they are able to detach Jesus from his popular support that the authorities will be able to carry out their own plan to silence him. And we see that in chapters 22 and 23. Meanwhile, Jesus proves more than a match for them in open debate. 
Now, the whole of chapter 20, as we consider the first part here of chapter 20, the whole of chapter 20 is set in the court of Gentiles, which is a vast public area surrounding the temple building, some 33 acres in size, which at Passover time would have been crowded with pilgrims all, from all over the Jewish world, in which a teacher could easily gather a crowd if he was indeed... Uh, teaching with some sort of authority where people would listen. And so the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders, who are, let us not forget this, who are the same group, three groups that Jesus predicted would reject him in Jerusalem back in chapter 9, verse 22, they were the three groups that made up the Sanhedrin, the ruling council of Israel, which under Roman occupation had been granted authority to regulate local affairs as well as strictly religious responsibility. And so as they have been given that responsibility through the Roman occupation, the temple area was their power base, which is where we see this taking place here in the life of Jesus. And so with this being the context of where we find ourselves today, let me begin by making my first observation from this text. Submitting to God's authority. We see this in verses 1 through 8. Submitting to God's authority. So the text tells us that Jesus was teaching the people in the temple and preaching the gospel, as the text opens up in chapter 20, when these religious leaders confronted him. Now notice the timing of what is taking place here. Jesus is actively engaged in ministry. Jesus is doing exactly what the Messiah should be doing when they challenge his right to do it. And so the question of legitimate authority runs through this whole Jerusalem phase of the story that leads up to Jesus' arrest and leads to his trial. Now, the irony here is striking as we consider this story. The irony is striking. They are questioning Jesus' authority while he is exercising it in exactly the way the prophets had foretold. He is doing exactly what was foretold about him in this place, and they are questioning the very thing that Jesus is doing as the very Messiah that was going to come to them. Yet, from the vantage point of the official leadership, a Galilean visitor with no formal rabbinic training had no right to set himself up as an authority in their temple as Jesus had done both by his high-handed action in driving out money changers and by his teaching. And so the religious leaders question the authority of Jesus. And as they question the authority of Jesus, their question is actually two-pronged. One, tell us by what authority you are doing these things, or who gave you this authority? Where does your authority come from? You're teaching as if, as someone who has authority. Where does your authority come from? But their question reveals something deeper. You see, they believe, these religious leaders believed, they were the gatekeepers of divine authority in Israel. After all, they held the positions, they had the education, they controlled the temple system. And so in their minds, any legitimate authority within this realm, within this temple realm, it had to flow through them. And so this self-appointed Messiah, this Jesus that is now here and, and exercising some sort of authority among the people, seemed determined to cause trouble. And if they had not checked off on his credentials, if they had not checked off on his authority, then he was way out of line. But Jesus' response is brilliant, as would be typical of God the Son. He answers their question with a question. He says in verse 3, I will also ask you a question. Now tell me, was the baptism of John from heaven or from man? Now this isn't... Jesus being evasive. This is Jesus exposing their hearts. Now, this may not mean a lot to us. We may read that and go, what what has John the Baptist got to do with anything? I mean, mean, that guy had his head chopped off a long time ago. Like, what is is he still doing here, right? 
But this question from Jesus is significant. You see, John the Baptist explicitly testified about Jesus' identity and Jesus' authority. Remember? If they acknowledged that John's authority came from heaven, they would have to acknowledge Jesus' authority too. But if they denied John's authority, as they say, they would face the crowds who recognized John as a prophet. John had no formal authorization, but his ministry had made a profound impression. So what will they do? How will they answer this question? How will they get out of this unscathed without giving Jesus the authority that is rightly His, nor uh, without, without minimizing John and facing the wrath of the crowd? Well, look at verses 5 through 7. And I imagine this scene, it's funny, you think about these dudes scurrying up, you know, like in a huddle. Like, you know, all right, what are we going to do? You know, like arms around each other. Text says, they discussed it with one another, saying, If we say from heaven, he will say, Why do you not believe him? But if we say from man, all the people will stone us to death, for they are convinced that John was the prophet. And then you know, you got one guy go, I got an idea. Let's just say we don't know. <laughs> Ignorance. So they answered that they did not know where it came from. Well, Luke already told us in chapter 7, 29 through 30, that the religious leaders, unlike all the people, had not approved John's ministry. But they dare not confront the popular enthusiasm for John directly. Just as now they are inhibited by popular support for Jesus. Think about this. These were the religious authorities in Israel. And they are claiming ignorance about one of the most significant spiritual movements of their time. One of the most significant spiritual movements they have ever seen. And they're going, well, we don't have an answer for that. We're just going to leave it be. Their answer reveals that they are not actually interested in truth. They are interested in protecting their own authority. Because they will not answer Jesus, what does Jesus do? Well, then he makes no formal response either. But we've seen that his counter-question clearly implies a claim to the same divine authority that John had. And the following parable, portraying him as the son of the vineyard owner, will reinforce that very claim. But before we get there, these verses speak powerfully to our own hearts. And they really do when you think about submitting to God's authority. How often do we find ourselves behaving like these religious leaders? We may not directly challenge Jesus' authority, but we do it in more subtle ways. We do it when we selectively obey Scripture, choosing which parts of Scripture we will submit to and which ones we won't. We do it when we resist God's leading, when it conflicts with our, with our own plans or with our own dreams. We do it when we question God's wisdom, when His ways do not align with our preferences. Further, we must realize that all legitimate authority flows from God Himself. Jesus' authority didn't come from the religious leader's recognition. It came directly from His Father. This is why Jesus could teach with such confidence and why His words carried such weight. He wasn't operating on delegated human authority. He was exercising divine authority. And just as Jesus' authority was challenged in the temple, His authority is still challenged in the temple of our hearts. The question isn't whether Jesus has authority. That's not the question. He claimed all authority in heaven and on earth after His resurrection. We know this in the Great Commission. The question is whether we will submit to that authority. We must recognize that God's authority is absolute and universal, church. 
It's not limited to certain areas of our lives, and it's not limited to certain days of the week. His authority extends over our relationships. His authority extends over our finances. His authority extends over our career decisions. His authority extends over our entertainment choices. His authority extends over our political positions. His authority extends over everything. And we must also, we also must respond to Jesus' authority with honest self-examination like those religious leaders. We are capable, and we all know this, and you know this about yourself, you may not admit it, I'll admit it, I'm very capable and very good at this. We are capable of crafting elaborate justifications for our disobedience, aren't we? Aren't we? We are. Further, our submission to God's authority must be active submission. This means deliberately bringing our decisions, our plans, and our desires under Christ's lordship. When we surrender to his authority, hear this, because our flesh says the complete opposite of this. When we surrender to Christ's authority, we aren't losing control we are coming under the perfect leadership of the one who has all authority in heaven and on earth. We are relinquishing our lives to him because we know that everything that he brings to us is for our good and his glory. Second observation, faithfully stewarding God's gifts. This is 20 verses 9 through 18. So Jesus' parable reflects the agrarian situation in Palestine where absentee landlords let out estates to tenant farmers in return for an agreed share of the produce. So a vineyard was a long-term investment in that new vines would not produce a significant harvest and therefore any profit for either owner or tenants until about the fourth year. Now, although Luke does not include direct echoes of Isaiah chapter 5, verses 1 and 2, with which Mark and Matthew begin this parable, the imagery of Israel as God's vineyard was well known from several Old Testament passages. And the theme of fruit denied would probably call Isaiah 5, 1 through 7 to mind without explicit allusion. And so this then is a story of God's dealing with Israel, but especially with Israel's leaders presented by as the tenant farmers here. So after exposing the religious leaders' hearts regarding authority, Jesus turns to this parable that would have immediately resonated with his audience. A man planted a vineyard and led it out to tenants and went into another country for a long while. Again, every Jewish person would have recognized this imagery. And again, the vineyard is the metaphor for Israel with God as its owner and Israel's leaders as its tenants working the vineyard. But notice how Jesus develops this familiar language in this parable. The owner sends servant after servant to collect what he's rightfully owed as the tenants were faithfully to, were to faithfully steward what had been given to them. And each servant, these servants representing the prophets of God that had been sent to Israel, each servant is beaten, treated shamefully, and sent away empty-handed. And so the sequence of abused servants represents the prophets whose maltreatment at the hands of Israel's leaders was a familiar theme. We saw this in Luke already in chapter 11, 40. 37 through 51 in chapter 13, 33 through 34. And so this is all pointing back to something that is very, very, has been common in Israel's history. Then the parable reaches its climax in verse 13 when the owner says, what shall I do? I will send my beloved son. Perhaps they will respect him. Now, the repetition of the same words used in the divine declaration at Jesus' baptism in Luke chapter 3, verse 22, where the Father says, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. The repetition ensures that Luke's readers cannot miss the reference to God sending His Son Jesus as His last appeal to rebellious Israel. 
in this context where the son is about to be killed, there is also a poignant echo of Abraham's intended sacrifice of Isaac going all the way back to Genesis 22 too. Jesus is clearly identifying himself in this moment as God's beloved son sent after all the prophets. But notice the tenant's response in verse 14. But when the tenants saw him, they said to themselves, this is the heir. Let us kill him so so that the inheritance may be ours. Now listen, it is highly unlikely that in reality the murder of the owner's son would allow the tenants to take possession as long as the owner himself was still alive. But a parable doesn't necessarily have to reflect real life. And the tenant's scheme prompts the reader to recognize that the confrontation in Jerusalem represents this climactic showdown between the present leadership and God himself as represented in his son Jesus. Why? There's no room for both. So what did they do? They threw him out the vineyard and killed him, we see in verse 15. Here we have a veiled but unmistakable indication that Jesus is expecting to be executed. They threw him out of the vineyard. The site of the crucifixion was outside of the city walls. Now let's stop for a second. Because I think what Christ is getting at here in in exposing these religious leaders is is a matter of stewardship and what God has given to them and how they've squandered it. Uh, They've been given basically everything God had promised them, and they just trashed it all, rejected the prophets, killed or will kill the Messiah. Because I think that it also has parallels in what Jesus is doing here. It, it, It connects with us as we consider our own stewardship. You see, God had entrusted Israel and her leadership to steward His name and to steward His people as they await the Messiah. And they'd squandered it. They used their status. They used their positions for their own gain in the place of God's glory. God has entrusted also each of us with a portion, if you will, of His vineyard, of His kingdom, of His purpose. For some, it's literal resources. Some, money, property, possessions. For others, it's talents, abilities, or influence. For all of us, it's the gospel itself. And so the question is, how are we managing what belongs to God? You see, the tenants in this parable made three critical errors that we must avoid as tenants of God's gospel and gifts that He's given us. They made three errors. First, they forgot their position. They were stewards, not owners. And when we start treating God's gifts gifts as if they are our own personal possessions, we've already stepped into dangerous territory. Your abilities given to you by God. Your resources provided by God. Your influence granted by God. Your next breath, a gift from God. Your salvation, a gift from God that you did not earn nor deserve. Second, they rejected their responsibility. The owner had a right to expect returns from his vineyard. Similarly, God has expectations for how we use what he's entrusted to us. We've already seen this in the parable of the talents. Are we investing our time, our talents, our resources in the gospel in ways that advance his kingdom? Or are we squandering them on purely personal pursuits? Are we sowing gospel seeds in evangelism and asking God to grow them? Or are we kept silent in a world in desperate need of the truth of the gospel? Third, they rebelled against the rightful heir. This wasn't just poor stewardship. This was outright rebellion. In our lives, this looks like knowingly choosing to use God's gifts in ways that dishonor Him. It's using our words to tear down instead of build up. It's using our money to serve self instead of others. It's using our influence to draw attention to ourselves instead of pointing to Christ. And what are the consequences for rejecting Jesus and wrongly stewarding God's gracious gifts? The consequences are quite severe. Look at the second part of 15 and verse 16. What then will the owner of the vineyard do to them? He will come and destroy those tenants and give the vineyard to others. 
This clearly indicates the end of the present leadership of Israel. But who are the others? Well, at a political level, the thought could be of the coming Roman destruction of Jerusalem and the disillusion of its, of its ruling Sanhedrin. But Matthew's version of this parable speaks of the kingdom of God being taken away from you and giving to a people who will produce its fruit. We see that in Matthew 21, 43, which seems to envision a new Israel. That is, as the vineyard refers to God's kingdom, it will now be offered to the Gentiles whose time has now come. And the people's response, surely not, they say. Surely not. And this suggests the shocking nature of this radical idea. They expressed horror at the whole course of events in this parable. And their hearts, furthermore, were favorably disposed to the preaching of Jesus. Jesus then quotes from Psalm 118, 22. He said, in the psalm, they refer to the king rescued from his enemies and established as God's ruler. So also Jesus, rejected and crucified by those who saw him as a threat to their power, will be restored and have ultimate authority. This quotation has introduced the new metaphor of a cornerstone. You've heard this, we sang it moments ago which is probably to be understood as the keystone at the top of a corner of a building. Without the cornerstone, the two walls built up upon it would collapse. And so Jesus, rejected by official Israel, is the key foundational element of God's building, the church. And there's two prophetic allusions that develop this metaphor in Isaiah 8, 14 and 15, and Daniel 2, 34 and 35. And in the setting where they have just challenged Jesus' authority, this was, a, this was clearly a deliberate and public counter-challenge. Jesus is calling on the people as a whole to support him against their official leadership, we see in verse 19. And if they had any doubts whether Jesus was a serious threat to the status quo and to their public authority, this parable has removed them all. This is going to be a fight to the death. Third observation. Rendering to both God and government. Look at verses 20 through 26. This is a passage that many of us know uh, well. The frustrated attempt of Jesus' opponents to seize him is followed by the well-known pronouncement story on paying taxes or tribute to Caesar. Jesus' opponents sought to entrap him in his words so that accusations could be brought against him before the Roman governor. Now, after flattering Jesus about his truthfulness and fidelity toward God, we see in verses 20 and 21, they raised a question that placed Jesus on the horns of a dilemma here. The question involves whether one should pay taxes to Caesar. If Jesus said no, they could report to the governor that he was teaching sedition, and Rome would immediately act and arrest him. If, on the other hand, he said yes, then he would lose the favor of the people, for they loathed paying this poll tax to their pagan oppressors. For many, this tax was an insult to God, who alone was the true ruler of Israel. Church, this also mirrors our own struggles with dual citizenship. Being both citizens of heaven and citizens of earth. As it relates to taxes, one of the most challenging applications of Jesus' teaching about dual citizenship comes when our tax dollars support policies that conflict with our biblical convictions. Whether it's funding for practices that Scripture deems immoral or policies that appear to contradict biblical values, we can feel deeply conflicted about our financial participation through taxation. I think all of us can agree with that. So Jesus has asked this question, And watch his response. First, he takes a denarius, which is a Roman silver coin used for paying taxes, and he asks, whose likeness and inscription is on it? The coin bore Caesar's image declaring his authority in the civil realm. 
Now, Genesis tells us that humans bear the image of God, declaring his ultimate authority over all of life. And some interpret the word likeness or image in this passage as possibly intended to suggest an analogy with the image of God in Genesis 1.27 as, as the coin belongs to Caesar, so we belong to God. Nonetheless, they replied, Caesar. And Jesus' answer, then render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. This answer cleverly avoids a simple yes or no. Notice he doesn't say give to Caesar instead of God or give to God instead of Caesar. Render suggests that taxation is a proper return for the benefits received through government, hopefully good government. Paying taxes isn't endorsing every government expenditure. It's fulfilling our civic duty as commanded by Scripture. Our responsibility is to obey God in what He has commanded us, paying taxes particularly here, while trusting Him with what we cannot control, which is how they are used. This is far from the zealot ideology which saw Rome as simply the enemy of Israel and of God. But the second clause sets civic duty in the broader context of the kingdom of God. For the the rebel Judas, Judas the Galilean and his followers, Rome was diametrically opposed to God. But Jesus implies that there may be good government under God as there was at this time while Tiberius was emperor. So there's no necessary conflict here. But Jesus' formula, even in this moment, does not address the question of how God's people should respond when Caesar sets himself up against God, as would happen with later emperors. But he does establish a principle of dual responsibility that we are still wrestling with today. So what belongs to Caesar? Well, in our context, paying our taxes honestly and on time, obeying civil laws and regulations, participating responsibly in civil society, respecting government authorities even when we disagree, and contributing to the common good of our communities. But also remember Caesar's image was on the coin. What belongs to God? What bears God's image? We do. This means everything we are, everything we have, belongs fundamentally to God. While we have civil obligations, our ultimate allegiance is to God. Give to God what belongs to God, which is faith, love, praise, glory, and obedience. This command stands above the other, even as the command to love God stands before and is the ground for loving one's neighbor. This shapes how we make ethical decisions in our workplace, how we vote and participate in politics, how we respond to the laws that challenge or are contradictory to our faith, how we engage with cultural issues, and how we prioritize our resources. Now this principle of dual citizenship becomes particularly relevant as we approach elections. And it just so happens that we have a major election on Tuesday. As Christians, again, we often feel the tension between our heavenly values and our earthly choices. But Jesus' wisdom about rendering to both Caesar and God provides us with a framework for electoral engagement. And as we think through this as Christians, we must guard against two common extremes. On one side, some Christians completely disengage, claiming politics is too worldly. On the other side, some place so much hope in political solutions that they essentially make politics their religion. But Jesus' teaching calls us to a balanced middle ground, engaged but not enslaved, participating but not possessed. As one of your pastors, 
I've been commissioned by God to shepherd the flock of God among me. And as shepherds of God's flock, pastors have a responsibility to God believers through every aspect of life with biblical wisdom, including their civil and political engagement. Just as Jesus didn't avoid the tax question but addressed it with divine wisdom, pastors must help their congregations navigate these complex waters with biblical truth. As we have a presidential election on Tuesday, I will say that I've had more conversations with you and many others about this election than I've ever had in my entire life about a single election. In these conversations, I've gathered that there is much turmoil regarding political parties, regarding candidates, and who to vote for, or what to do. And as one of your pastors, I think it would be irresponsible for me not to offer a few thoughts regarding the election Tuesday while offering some biblical wisdom, much of which I think comes from this passage. But before I share these next thoughts, I want to be crystal clear. Crystal clear. What you are about to hear is not a political statement. It is not a political statement. It is biblical truth. I realize that in our current climate, it is nearly impossible for many of us to hear anything touching on civic life without filtering it through our political lenses. This is not a political statement. We've become so conditioned by cable news, social media, and partisan rhetoric that we often hear political when someone is in fact speaking biblical. But as your pastor, my responsibility isn't to cater to any political ideology. It is to faithfully teach God's Word. And so the quick principles I'm going to give aren't drawn from any political party platform or political philosophy. They are drawn from Scripture. And if you disagree with me on that, then let it be so. These statements may challenge Republicans. They may challenge Democrats. They may challenge independents alike because God's truth transcends our political categories. So I'm asking you to temporarily set aside your political filters and hear these words simply as biblical truth that should shape our worldview regardless of our political affiliations. And let me say this, rarely, if ever, do I do this. Ever. Rarely, if ever, have you ever heard me say a single word about current events unless they directly affect so many people in this congregation that it is necessary to address them. And I'll tell you this, it's not fun because some people are going to walk out of here today and they're going to have a different perspective on church or what we do here. Rarely do I do this. But I want to be crystal clear again. Scripture is our driving force. When you go to the polls on Tuesday, I want you to keep a few things in mind. And this barely brushes the surface, but it's just a few things to keep in mind. Many of you have expressed to me that you do not like either candidate, leaving you confused on what to do. Many believers find themselves in the same challenging position, feeling that neither presidential candidate fully represents their biblical values. And this tension is real, and this tension is valid. We know that. Finding a presidential candidate or any other politician, for that matter, that reflects the righteousness of Christ is near impossible. I'm not going to tell you who to vote for, but I want you to prayerfully consider which candidate's policies, not personality, their policies, better protect life, support biblical values, defend religious liberty, and uphold God's design for humanity. Sometimes faithful Christian citizenship means choosing between imperfect options while keeping our ultimate hope firmly planted in Christ's kingdom. At the very least, 
I will ask you to consider this when going to the polls. The image of God in all people. There are politicians and policies who are seeking to destroy those created in the image of God. Genesis 1.27 establishes one of the most fundamental truths of human existence. This isn't a political statement. Genesis 1.27 establishes one of the most fundamental truths of human existence. It's the foundation of human dignity, and it's the foundation of human worth. Every person from the moment of conception bears the divine imprint of their Creator. This truth has profound implications. It means that every human life has inherent dignity, every human life has inherent value, and every human life has inherent purpose. Not because of what they do, but because of whose image they bear. They don't bear Caesar's image. They bear the image of God. The psalmist describes how God forms us in the womb, knitting us together with divine craftsmanship in Psalm 139, 13 and 14. From the very moment of conception, each person bears God's image as, he's, as either male or female. Part of his design, perfect design for humanity. As bearers of God's image, we have a sacred responsibility to protect and nurture human life at every stage. There are some policies and politicians who promote abortion on demand, destroying image bearers in the name of birth control. I ask you to consider this when you go to the polls. When we fail to protect the unborn, we are destroying image bearers of God. Further, there are politicians and policies that deny the fundamental reality of God's design of male and female. When we deny this fundamental reality, we are rejecting God's creative wisdom. Some politicians and policies allow our daughters and sisters to be preyed upon through sports and other avenues that allow men to compete and dominate women. This is something we must stand against. Further, some politicians and policy dis support the destruction of young minds through dangerous gender ideology, causing confusion about their God-given identity. The enemy is using this to destroy those created in the image of God, something we must fight against. Scripture calls us to be defenders of those who cannot defend themselves, Proverbs 31, 8 and 9. This means standing for truth when others compromise. It means protecting the unborn when others would deny their humanity. It means affirming God's design for gender when others would confuse it. It means ensuring that every, every image bearer has the opportunity to flourish according to God's design. These are just a couple of things to keep in mind. There are so many others. But church, we must know elections have consequences. And this perspective should shape how we vote, how we engage in civil discourse, and how we treat every single person we encounter as equal image bearers of God. We're not just defending political positions. We are upholding the dignity of divine image bearers and working to see every person reach their God-given potential in alignment with his design and his purpose. Scripture calls us to speak truthfully when leaders enact policies that destroy rather than protect life, that confuse rather than clarify truth, that harm rather than help. Like Daniel before Nebuchadnezzar, like Nathan before David, like John the Baptist before Herod, we must speak truth while remaining focused on God's kingdom rather than earthly politics. So as you go to the polls on Tuesday... Evaluate candidates through the lens of biblical values, not just party loyalty, or not just a disdain for a party. Pray for wisdom. Pray for discernment in our electoral choices. Remember that our hope lies not in the electoral outcomes, but in Christ's kingdom. It doesn't matter what Wednesday morning says. That's not where our hope lies.
treat those who vote differently with Christian love and respect, and engage in political discourse in ways that honor Christ. But let us never, ever forget, no matter what happens this week, our hope is not in a president. Our hope is in King Jesus who sits on his throne. His will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Pray with me.